Renowned biologist and author E.O. Wilson recently visited the Bay Area to raise money for the development of a new online science textbooks and to promote his first novel, Ant Hill. KQED's Quest series producer Amy Miller sat down to talk with Wilson about his book and his lifelong passion for the natural world. Edward Osborne Wilson is one of the most important biologists of our time. He's a prolific writer and leading researcher in evolutionary biology. He's been called the father of biodiversity after first describing the concept in 1985. And he's dedicated much of his life and work to environmental conservation and science education. As the world's foremost authority on ants, Wilson has discovered hundreds of new species. His lifelong study of ants culminated in the definitive publication on the topic for which he was awarded his second Pulitzer Prize for nonfiction. He's recently published his first fiction novel, called Ant Hill, which is based closely on his own life growing up as a young naturalist in rural Alabama. Tell me about your new book, Ant Hill. It's about a family in the southern, rather backwater city of Mobile, Alabama, as they pass through three generations with the civil rights revolution um, having succeeded and its memories beginning to fade, although it's still a long way to go, uh, the South now faces a new crisis of which most Southerners are unaware, which is how to manage the land before they destroy it. So the human side of the story is about the coming of age of a young boy that grows up in the midst of this. Young Raphael an only child uh, is living with his two parents in the little town of Clayville. I've based Clayville uh, intimately upon my own knowledge of South Alabama. Young Raphael is able to go out in a short distance to a rare area of still relatively untouched southern forest. He acquires a deep knowledge of the area, becomes bonded to it. And then upon learning that like most of the rest of the South, in that area in particularly, uh, it's about to go under uh, development, he vows to uh, find the way to save his beloved forest. And then the rest of the novel plays out as the bitter conflicts between classes, uh, between families, uh, between developers and the rising conservation movement in that part of the world. And through all these struggles, Raphael provides, through his uh, college senior thesis, a detailed description of the ants he has studied at Lake Knockaby. That becomes the Ant Chronicle, and that is the part that provides for the reader the first extended view of how ants, colonies are born, live, die in conflict and struggle for survival as seen by the ants themselves. Why did you want to tell the story from the ants perspective? Because it's never been done before. The terrestrial world at the level of little things um, is owned by the ants. Ants alone make up upwards of two-thirds of the weight of all insects in most parts of the world. They dominate the environment, and they do it by complex social behavior. Now, ants themselves are um, a um, very bizarre. First of all, all the members of the society are um, female. Um, the males are bred up by the colony for a very short period of time. They only have one function, and that's to mate with new virgin queens. As they age, ants change the labor, the form of labor. And um, the first thing they do, they serve as nurses for the queen, for the, for the little grub-like larvae. And then as they grow older, they, they start moving to the outside. They repair the nest. Uh, they um, stand guard. And finally, as they get considerably older, they become foragers, 
which is a high risk activity since a large percentage of ants are killed on every expedition taken out. So they are willing to throw away their lives. And as a result, they are also the warriors. And that's why I've generalized the difference between people and ants as whereas we send our young men to war, ants send their old ladies. What is the best thing people can do to protect the natural world? We've been paying a disproportionate amount of time on the physical work, climate change, exhaustion of, uh, of uh, non-renewable resources, pollution, and so on. We got the message, we're doing something there, beginning to do it. But we've sort of forgotten a lot about the living world that's disappearing. And I believe that there should be a great deal more effort put into exploring the living world. We know maybe no more than 10% of the species that actually exist. And we need to know a lot more about that in order to plan a sustainable world. You are a notorious optimist. Given the escalating rate of climate change and the seemingly endless string of environmental catastrophes like the Gulf oil spill, are you still optimistic? I used to describe myself as a um, cautious optimist. Right now I'm describing myself as a scared optimist. I know we can pull this off. That is, we can save most of the rest of life, but it's going to take um, a very considerable change in our attitudes, maybe even our worldview, and uh, considerable advances, which are to our advantage anyway, as a people and individually, in uh, education and science and technology and public policy. We have to make a much stronger effort in all those fields. Um, and I'm beginning to worry about whether we have the will to do it. We're at a crisis in education right now. The American public especially has to have a better grasp of science and technology to meet as the electorate and for guidance to their political leaders. The media then have fallen away. Uh, environmental reporting is on the decline nationally. Uh, in fact, we're in sort of a crisis at the present time of public understanding. How do we solve it? Well, I don't have a single simple formula, but my answer then, if I had to give a short one, is by paying attention and making the effort for the good of us all.